today we're going to finish up our special session on Laura Wells uh, in the Black Universe, which is which is a really incredible. Um, I actually have it right here. It's uh, we read the first part. It's on the Black Universe and the Human Foundations of Color. We read the first little bit um, in the previous session, and so now we're actually uh, I'm going to going to finish this and then we will return to Jan von Denberg's superlative crash course in stars and um, this is of course HD before bed so I'm talking quietly someone's sleeping in the other room so uh, this is for the low sound people out there and for people who like ASMR and all that stuff it's always fun ASMR you know it's ASMR sounds I don't know what I don't really know how to do this so that's just Okay, so I'm going to actually change to a uh, screen we have here, so I'm just going to start here. Solitude of the man without horizon who sees black and black. Well, actually, um, it was The universe is deaf and blind. We can only love it and assist it. Man is the being who assists the universe. Only with eyes closed can we unfold the future, and with eyes open can we conceive to enter it. Skip forward a little bit. Hmm. I'll just start back at, um, let's see, neither the Lord, ah, okay. Solitude of the man without horizon who sees black and black. The universe is deaf and blind. We can only love it and assist it. Man is the being who assists the universe. Only with the eyes closed can we unfold the future, and with the eyes opened can we conceive to enter it. Light strikes the earth with repeated blows, divides the world infinitely, solicits in vain the invisible universe. The universe was, quote, in, end quote, the world. And the world did not see it. Black, prior to light, is the substance of the universe, what escaped from the world before the world was born into the world. Black is the without ground, which fixes light in the remote where man observes it. Here lies the crazy and catatonic light of the world. That reminds me of um, the wonderful Maurice Blanchot, The Madness of the Day, which is where the light itself goes mad, the quality of the light itself the crazy catatonic light of the world. Laurel continues, Man approaches the world only by way of transcendental darkness, into which he never entered and from which he will never leave. A phenomenal blackness entirely fills the essence of man. Because of it, the most ancient stars of the paleocosmos, together with the most venerable stones of the archaeo earth, appear to man as being outside the world, and the world itself appears as outside world. The black universe, this is three now, three. The black universe is the opacity of the real, or the quote-unquote color that renders it invisible. No light has ever seen the black universe. Black is anterior to the absence of light whether this absence be the shadows that extinguish it, whether it be it nothingness or its positive opposite, the black universe is not a negative light. Black is the radical of color. What never was a color, nor the attribute of a color, the emotion seizing man when affected by a color. As opposed to the black objectified in the spectrum, black is already manifested, 
before any process of manifestation. This is vision in black. Black is entirely interior to itself and to man. Black is without opposite. Even light, which tries to turn it into its opposite, fails in the face of the rigor of its secret. Only the secret sees into the secret, like black and black. This reminds me a little bit of, um, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of French favorites. I, I don't know exactly why, other than maybe there were some really mutative cores in France. I mean, obviously the French Revolution and some of the philosophical movements, but um, I really like Bataille. I'm a big fan, or at least some of Bataille's work, and I, I like his theory of religion, which is a great compliment to Fraser's Golden Bow, uh, Freud's Totem and Taboo. Uh, really nice kind of compliment to, um, you know, Rene Girard and his work on mimetic desire and scapegoating. And, um, and also Jung. Jung looked at a lot of early, and people like Edward Edinger, who looked at the development of consciousness, or uh, uh, Marie-Louise von Franz, who, who did a lot of work on fairy tales and on early mythology. And, and so, you know, one of the things getting uh, getting into these these areas, and we go we go back and we go way back to wh where it all begins. And what Bataille does is he really shows us the foundation of of religion, and he shows that there is this this very interesting movement through things like sacrifice and through scapegoating and through um, sort of the movement from the five center to the seven center being. He doesn't understand it in terms of centers, but he, he describes it and he talks about how mammals, he just calls them animals. When he says animal, he distinguishes it from the human. You know, the, the animal he's talking about is, is the five centered being, the mammal. And he said, uh, it's a great quote, and he said, the lion is not the king of the jungle because kings subjugate, kings enslave. Animals don't enslave. Animals don't have slaves. The lion doesn't enslave other animals in the jungle, right? And he said something really nice. He said, um, animals are in the world like water in water. The lion is merely a larger wave crashing over smaller waves. And that kind of reminds me of this, you know, this idea that I like this idea that only the secret can see into the secret like black and black. You know, like water and water. And there is a secret there. There is a very mystical secret at the beginning of at the foundations of religion and the foundations of mystic, mysticism and so on. So um, let's continue for a little bit. The essence of color is not colored. It's the black universe. Metaphysical white is a simple discoloration, the prismatic or indifferent unity of colors. Phenomenal blackness is indifferent to color because it represents their ultimate degree of reality, that which prevents their final dissolution into the mixtures of light. Philosophy and sometimes painting treat black and white as contraries, colors as opposites. They mix them under the authority of light as the supreme mix. The human science of color is founded on the blackness known as the universe. They cognitively unify man, the universe, and color theory, and their potency is in black, which is their common reality, but in the last instance only. This is um, a reference to one of Laruel's concepts, determination in the last instance, how something is ultimately determined, kind of like at the end, you could say. Um, and it goes deeper than that, but that's a, at least a surface understanding of it. A human science of color makes the black universe the requisite that is real or imminent to their physics. And by the way, when I say a surface understanding, I mean probably an exactly opposite understanding of another deeper... It's pr tricky with Laruel, and it's also tricky because one of the premier Laruel scholars, Katerina Koltsova, who I was really lucky to get to be a teacher's assistant for with the new Center for Research and Practice, and where I met um, people like Avent Kang, the incredible violinist and, and also mystical and ph philosophy guy himself, and writer and everything, and just real you know Renaissance person. But 
um, it was a great class. And one of the things that I got into was, you know, Kolosova was all about, you know, eliminating conceptual baggage. That Laruel didn't like the conceptual baggage. That would be the whole chain of associations to a given word that sort of fix it. Because as soon as you've moved from what the word, he almost wanted to return it, kind of like Ra with keynoting. He wanted to return it to the word without the baggage. So the moment you, you go and add a whole lot of conceptual baggage to a keynote, you're describing it, sure, but it's also important to understand it without that conceptual baggage. To understand a word like survival, or a word like trauma, or a word like, um, yeah, you know, any of these words, that, but without the Freudian apparatus, without the common sort of understandings that we've built up around them. And more like bringing them back to their to their fundamentals, to their almost empty state, where they're empty, they're generics, they're kind of ready-mades, and they're ready to be deployed and ready to be used in different situations and sort of filled in with real examples, but they're also kept separate from the real examples. They're not seen as substitutes for those examples or anything like that. So. The humanist science of color makes the black universe, the, and this is now back to Laruel, the human science of color makes the black universe the requisite that is real or imminent to their physics. Black is the posture itself of science and of its, quote, quote, relation to color. Four, science is a way of thinking in black and white which studies the light of the cosmos and the color of the world. Black, by way of its posture, or its inherence to the real, white by way of its representation of the real, a way of thinking where white is no longer the opposite of black, but rather its positively discolored reflection. Science is the mode of, and he's disagreeing with this, of course, Laruel has a lot of contempt for this way of thinking. Science is the mode of thought in which black determines, in the last instance, white. Well, maybe he's actually not so critical here, because I know that he likes science, but it seemed like when he was saying, you make, oh, I see, no, okay, I, I'm sorry, I apologize. He is 100% in favor of this kind of science. I misread. He says, a way of thinking where white is no longer the opposite of black. What Laruel is really against is the oppositional thinking that puts white and black purely as opposites, right? This is not... It's not that he's opposed to binary thinking, it's that opposition is not binary enough. That opposition is not a true binary, not a difference in kind. It's interesting. Um, but he's actually in favor of seeing black as a positively discolored reflection of white. Very interesting. Science is the mode of thought in which black determines, in the last instance, white. Well, he likes this. I mean, if we substitute black and white for yin and yang, their classic correlations, we get some interesting things here. You know, this is almost a philosophy of the yin, a philosophy where the yin is ultimately the, the greater of the two, the greater container, and that the yin can represent the yang without losing its own resolution, but that the yang cannot represent the yin, that the yang reduces the resolution of the yin to quantitative difference in the way that the yang is, and sort of eradicates the difference in kind. So, so I... Yeah, just to be clear, I'll reread it now. When Lawell is talking about science, capital S science, he's in favor of this. This is, this is what he likes. Science is a way of thinking in black and white, which studies the light of the cosmos and the color of the world. Black by way of its posture or its inherence to the real. White by way of its representation of the real. A way of thinking where white is no longer the opposite of black but rather its positively discolored reflection. Science is the mode of thought in which black determines, in the last instance, white. The black universe transforms colors without mixing them. It simplifies color in order to bring out the whiteness of understanding in its essence of non-pictorial reflection. Our euchromia, to learn to think from the point of view of black, as what determines color in the last instance, rather than what limits it. What determines rather than limits color. Right, that's a very interesting idea. And this whole idea of non-pictorial reflection. 
reflection that is not based on, on pictures. It's kind of like Deleuze in his work on non-representational thought. And I guess Deleuze and Guattari both in Anti-Oedipus and then even further in a, a Thousand Plateaus where they really talk about representational thought. I mean, this is something that Deleuze had already begun uh, dealing with much earlier. Philosophical technology has been withdrawn mimetically from the world in order to reflect and reproduce it. Such technology is inadequate for thinking the universe. We are still postulating that reality is given to us through the paradigm of the world. We perpetuate the inhuman amphibology that confuses the world and the universe. We believe that reality is horizon and light, aperture and flash, whereas it resembles more the posture of the opaque non-relation to light. When exploring the universal dimension of the cosmic, we remain prisoners of cosmological difference. Our philosophers are children who are afraid of the dark. Philosophy is thinking by way of a generalized black box, quote, quote. It is the effort to fit black into light and to push it back to the rear of the caverns. Yet the cosmological generalization of black does not save it from its status as attribute. Quite the contrary. Black alone is subject and may render manifest the philosophical interlocking of concepts. This is a really beautiful part right here. I really like this, this part here. Do not think technology first, rocket, and the lift off of the rocket. Look instead like in the depths of a closed eye, into the opacity of knowledge, where, forming one with it, the rocket passes through infinite distances. Think according to the knowledge that steers the rocket as if in a dream, heavier and more transparent than the boundless night it penetrates with a silent thunderclap. Think science first. Stop sending your ships through the narrow cosmological corridor. Stop making them climb the extreme walls of the world. Let them jump over the cosmic barrier and enter into the hyperspace of the universe. Cease having them compete with light, for your rockets too can realize the more than psychic postural mutation and shift from light to black universe, which is no longer a color, from cosmic color to postural and subjective black. Let your rockets become subject of the universe and be present at every point of the remote. Simplify color. See black. Think white. See black rather than believe unconscious. And think white rather than believe conscious. See black. Not that all your suns have fallen. They have since reappeared, only slightly dimmer. But black is the, quote, color that falls eternally from the universe onto your earth. Yeah, big, big fan of, uh, that's Francois Laruelle, and uh, I don't know if this is a Alexander Galway uh, translation maybe, or, but in any case, um, really, really incredible. Uh, really love that. And, um, I'm now going to go back, uh, oop, let's switch it up a little bit. Let's go back to a Crash Course on Stars. And so I'm just going to be reading a little bit uh, from the Crash Course on Stars. I'll turn our image slideshow back on. And those are some nice images that we'll, that we'll toggle through. smaller there. All right, so picking up where we left off, Pisces to Aquarius. While we can enjoy the quiet beauty of the evening stars, the Earth is not close to being a perfect rotator. In modern times, this requires continuous corrections to our clocks. It's one of the cracks in the carefully constructed control mechanism of the seven centered realm. In the past, that wasn't a problem, of course, which is again a proof that transformation is in the detail, at least in this cycle of the cross of planning, showing that human evolution has its own development. To be seen, quote, where simultaneously occurring disparate phenomena can shed light on that. And that's from the Metabletica, The Changing Nature of Man by J.H. von Denberg, who we learned about uh, two episodes ago. So... 
And we have this wonderful graphic of uh, Pisces. The development here, I'll, I'll actually just uh, turn off the slideshow for now. Make this a little bit bigger. And I'll adjust it so you can see uh, some of the graphics we have. We have the constellation Aquarius here in the sidebar. And um, we see the Arabic names there, and we see a sidebar where it says Aquarius, where her astrological symbol is connected to the water's flow. It comes from this Egyptian concept of the river goddess pouring the contents of her jar into the Nile while holding a norm's nalatak, nilatik, a rod for measuring the rising waters of the Nile. The Greeks linked Aquarius to Ganymede, or Ganymede, Zeus's cup bearer. I've always said Ganymede, so. But, um, the development of Christianity is in the time that the spring equinox moved backwards out of Aries the ram into Pisces the fish at the knot in the cord, Alresha, the star Alresha. The fish symbolism, oh, this is interesting, so this is a great graphic, the knot of the cord. Very interesting. Alresha is the knot, and then we have I see Christ, the early church, supernova, industrial revolution. Very interesting, you know, the movement through. It's a great graphic there. So, the fish symbolism in the Bible is overwhelming, and Christians in the world use the fish as a sticker on their car, on flags, or whatever. And then the disciples, the fishermen, ask Christ where to find an opportunity so quickly to have the famous supper where they're advised to follow a woman wearing a jar, Aquarius. The figures of the two fishes of Pisces are positioned north of the ecliptic. The figure of Aquarius is positioned below the ecliptic, and the stream of water from the jar overlaps part of the second fish that swims along the ecliptic. Various dates have been given for vernal equinoxes entry into the constellation of Aquarius. All right, and I think, um, We'll continue on next time with the 88 constellations and asterisms. This has been a lot of fun. I'd love to hear your comments. What do you think about La Ruelle? What do you think about um, HD Stories Before Bed? Do you have any, uh, any favorite bedtime reading yourself? Please post in the comments. I'd love to hear. Thanks.